Hey Star Trek fans, Dan Gunther here. With this week's episode of Star Trek Discovery, we are hitting the halfway mark of the fifth and final season. So, without further ado, here are my thoughts on Season 5, Episode 5, Mirrors. And a warning, there are spoilers. This episode follows on immediately from the end of last week's episode, Face the Strange. The Discovery crew has followed the clue given to them by the Trill Janal, which has led them to this seemingly empty sector of space. However, they soon discover a wormhole, of sorts, as Stamets says, which leads to an area of extra-dimensional space. Burnham takes a shuttle, along with Book, and they cross into this strange region. Inside, they discover Mole and Locke's ship, destroyed. However, another vessel has found its way into this realm, and it's something neither of them expect the ISS Enterprise, the Mirror Universe counterpart to our universe's USS Enterprise. After a brief detour to learn about the history of the ISS Enterprise, which I'll get into in the Canon Connections section, there is a brief standoff between Book and Burnham and Maul and Locke, as the Discovery team tries to get their hands on the next clue, already in the possession of Locke. Throughout the story, we also get flashbacks to the first meeting between Maul and Locke, and what led to them being on the run together. And along the way, we learn some interesting facts about the pair of them, including that Locke is, in fact, a Breen. Lots of people on the internet already saw that coming, given many of the comments I've seen online. We also get some interaction between Book and Maul, following the revelation of their connection a couple of episodes back. David Ajala plays this perfectly, and I completely bought the emotionalism and pain that he's going through, still dealing with the loss of his planet and the unexpected link to Maul. As for Maul herself, Eve Harlow plays her expertly here as well, with the character alternating between swagger when dealing with Burnham and Book at the beginning, to the emotional vulnerability and seeming to be on the verge of a breakdown when things get heavy, both in the present and in the flashbacks. She's been a wonderful addition to the cast this season, and I really look forward to seeing more from her. Similarly, Elias Tufexis as Locke is great and has a lot to play with in this episode, with his sheltered innocence in his early days still with the Breen, and his dogged determination to protect Maul, as well as his kind of wavering on the idea of turning themselves into Starfleet. Locke and Maul's dynamic is such that it seems he might be the one to ultimately reach, with Maul being more of the driving force in their law-breaking ways. The inclusion of the Mirror Universe was a nice surprise, and one that I'm glad they've gone to, with this being the final season, and the Mirror Universe playing such a big role in the story of Discovery. Much like last week's episode, which played like the greatest hits of Discovery's history, Mirrors gives us a sort of return to something that has also been very important to Discovery's past, which is again interesting given that they didn't know it was the final season while they were filming it. Overall, I found this episode to be a really good one for character growth, with both Maul and Locke's motivations coming into a clearer focus. I did find the placement of the flashbacks to Maul and Locke's early days kind of odd though, but I did appreciate the revelations they brought. There's also the ongoing relationship drama between Burnham and Book, which plays very well here, and I love that even though they are currently not a romantic couple, they still work very well together. That of course makes sense, given that they were couriers together for nearly a year before they actually became a couple. The ease with which they play off each other and Burnham's revelation to Book about her encounter with the past version of him in the last episode tells me that they very likely will not end the season still broken up. There are a couple of other things going on in this episode, namely Rainer's first command of Discovery and a continuation of Culber's reaction to his hosting of Janal's consciousness. Both of these are interesting, and I really enjoyed the interplay between Culber and Tilly in this episode. I'm kind of looking forward to further exploration of what's going on with Hugh. As for Rainer, I loved him in Command of Discovery and his slow realization of what the Discovery crew can do, as well as the Discovery crew slowly getting used to him. I predict that his command of the crew will be a well-oiled machine by the end of the season. Definitely a good episode, with some very interesting canon connections, which I will get to soon. Not quite at the high bar of last week's episode, which would be really hard to beat, but a fun romp that gets us one step closer to the ultimate goal of finding the progenitor's tech. Now for the easter eggs and canon connections in this episode. We get a stardate for this episode thanks to Book's log recording. It's currently stardate 866218.9. We learn Maul's full name, Maline Ravel, thanks to this computer readout, which appears in Federation Standard. This language, which I'm not sure of off the top of my head, let me know in the comments if you know it, and Andorian. 
Mention is made in this episode of Rainer's Species. He is a Kelleran, a previously one-off species which appeared in the Deep Space Nine Season 2 episode Armageddon Game. If you followed behind-the-scenes info prior to this season's release, you likely already knew that, but this is the first time that his species is mentioned on screen. We also learn that the Kelleran like to boil their cakes. Apparently, an ensign aboard Discovery keeps a Cardassian vole as a pet. These handsome creatures were mentioned as infesting Deep Space Nine, and we see them in the DS9 Season 2 episode, Playing God. As I mentioned earlier, we discover that Locke is a Breen. While these helmeted warriors have been seen in a number of episodes of Deep Space Nine, we've never seen one without a helmet, and apparently no one outside of the Breen knows what they look like, which is odd given that Kira Nerys has stolen and worn a Breen uniform and helmet, not once, but twice. The Breen we see here in the 32nd century seem to have changed up their look a little bit, and no longer look exactly like the bounty hunter Boosh from Return of the Jedi. Now that we've gotten to know Locke, we know what the Breen look like under their helmets, although they apparently have two forms, the standard humanoid look Laak tends to support, and a translucent, more amorphous form that the Breen seem to prefer, calling the more solid form old and unnecessary. Given that Locke is stabbed in this episode and seems to leak some sort of blood-like goo I initially thought this was a mistake, given that we learn in the Deep Space Nine episode by Inferno's Light that the Breen don't have blood. However, if the Breen are usually in this glowing form and eschew the solid form, maybe they don't usually have blood. Mole mentions Tribbles while being questioned by Locke in the flashback. While they are escaping the interdimensional pocket aboard the ISS Enterprise, Book turns up the lights on the bridge, calling back to the fact that Terran ships are kept dark because of the light sensitivities of the Terrans of the Mirror Universe. Book asks if Burnham is going to say hit it, which was Pike's catchphrase while commanding the Enterprise. Burnham replies that it feels weird, even though she is currently commanding an Enterprise and decides to stick with her let's fly catchphrase. Mention is made of a Gormagander's digestive tract. The Gormagander is the space whale that was introduced in Discovery, first seen in the episode Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad. And finally, let's talk about the ISS Enterprise. We first saw this ship when Kirk, McCoy, Scotty, and Uhura crossed over into the Mirror Universe in the TOS episode, Mirror Mirror. In that episode, the Prime Universe Kirk convinced the Mirror Spock that the Empire was illogical, and as we learn later in Deep Space Nine, Spock went on to make reforms that fundamentally changed the Terran Empire. This leads me to make an observation in this episode, that when Burnham is asked if she knows anything about the Mirror Spock, she replies that he was probably just as ruthless as the rest of them. Later, when they are learning about the history of the ISS Enterprise and how it was used to transport refugees, Book mentions the Terran High Chancellor who made reforms and was killed for it. I'm assuming that this was Spock, based on this dialogue from the Deep Space Nine episode Crossover. Almost a century ago, a Terran starship captain named James Kirk accidentally exchanged places with his counterpart from your side due to a transporter accident. While your Kirk was on this side, he met a Vulcan named Spock and somehow had a profound influence on him. Afterwards, Spock rose to commander-in-chief of the Empire by preaching reforms, disarmament, peace. It was quite a remarkable turnabout for his people. I find it truly sad that Burnham never learned that Spock led the reforms of the Empire. She and Book do learn, however, about a certain Kelpian slave turned rebel leader who helped the refugees flee, which they and we assume to be Saru. And of course, we learn at the end of the episode that the people fleeing the Empire aboard the Enterprise did make it to the Prime Universe after all, including the scientist who left the clue there for Burnham and Book to find. Well, that was everything that I found in this episode. What did I miss? Please let me know in the comments. Thank you to the Patreon supporters for helping bring this video to you. And to everyone else, thank you so very much for watching. I always love talking about new episodes of Star Trek, and I really hope you're enjoying these breakdowns too. Be sure to subscribe to catch new episode reviews and other videos on this channel. Let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos, and I'll see you in the next one. Live long and prosper.